uh, that, that exists. Even, even within the text themselves, 2,000 years roughly of time. You have uh, the time between the events of the writing of Genesis 12 through 25. <laughs> There's, there's a lot of time that exists between uh, those periods of time. But Moses writes them all at one time. Right there before they're entering into the promised land. Gospels are written a couple of decades, the first one at best, after the life and the ministry of Jesus. Right? Mark's first gospel, what, around 45 A.D.? If Jesus lives, you know, let's say, you know, up to 30, 33 years, we're talking 12, 15 years. Um, after the life of the ministry of Jesus, before the first gospel is, is, is compiled, put together. And you have Matthew, Luke, and John, written later time after that. So you have to reconcile, to sort of deal with some of these interpretive issues. Time between the final revelation in, in the late 90s to today. Um... Uh, we must remember, right, that there is literary, the Bible, uh, the books of the Bible are literary pieces carefully crafted to sounds, uh, to their themes. They're not transcripts or they're not merely scissor and paste collections haphazardly and chronologically put together. There's a purpose and an order behind what's being compiled here for us. And we, want to, we want to sort of help them to to really gather that, but then also to be aware of the challenge of the interpretation. There's cultural distance that exists between the biblical world and modern culture. Um, cultural distance between uh, the biblical world and modern culture. That's what we were talking about earlier. They were primarily agrarian. They're landowners, farmers, tenant farmers. E even from into the New Testament, you find the first century, the majority of them are agrarian. They had certain customs, practices, there were certain cultural things, norms that existed in their day and time. So whether you're um, whether you're a Jew in the wilderness, an Israelite in the wilderness, to a first century Jew in the middle of uh, Corinth or Philippi or, or Ephesus or um, or whatever, there are there are customs, there are practices, there are cultural things that that the, the, the interpreter needs to be aware of or at least be familiar with. As he's preparing to study and 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 then to deliver God's word, you know, he's it's, it's thinking about um, when Paul writes to the church of Corinth. Well, who was Corinth? What were some of the cultural things that were going on in Corinth that would have maybe um, led to some of the divisions that were taking place there in the church of Corinth? Um, so it's cultural, practical. Um, Customs and principles that we that we need to need to be aware of. It's thinking through some of those distances that exist. Uh, versus, say, our cultural values, or within the context that we're in West Africa, their cultural values. Um, you know, I'll give you sort of an example of, of just sort of the cultural idea um, and how we sort of bridge that. I lived in Burkina Faso when I was in um, in college for a semester. Um, I lived for a semester when I was in college. I lived in Burkina Faso, uh, Where is and that? huh? Where's that? It's, uh, it's off the coast in West Africa, between Ghana and um, it's right in there. They uh, animism is a is a very large, a very big um, issue in, in West Africa. The worship of ancestors, ancestral worship, not. Wanting to upset the ancestors, and so there's there sacrifices and things that they do. Um, animism is a, it's a very demonic, extremely demonic, oppressive type of practice, uh, and usually it gets uh, syncretized with something else. We we saw Catholics who would go to Catholic mass, and then later in the week would go to the shaman um, and offer chicken sacrifice for their family. Well, we had a we had a, a friend that we knew there um, who passed away, and we uh, in in their worship of ancestors and in their practice of venerating the dead, they he 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 is brought to town um, in our village and put up on this huge pedestal. And I mean, like like ten, eleven feet up in the air, and there's his body. 
and all his belongings are there up there with him. Um, and for about three days, it's nonstop just sort of mourning and wailing and playing these large xylophones. And there he sits, and there's just dancing. And it's just like this very uh, oppressive, dark situation. Well, you know that they're, they're worshiping and, and venerating him and sending him on to the afterlife. And it's also, um, it's also a, a way of sort of warding off any bad spirits that might exist. So there's cultural principles and there's cultural things that are existing in this time. And so we're having to think through, okay, how how do we how do we how do we deal with that? And so what we would do is um, you know, thinking about scripture, we want we want to honor, right? We want to honor uh, the family and we want to sort of show our respects and we want to, to love them and so we, we came and we, we, we greeted them. We spent a little bit of time there, but then we left and we didn't, we didn't come back. And we, by sh- not showing our presence and supporting of what they were doing was part of our way of recognizing we need to, we need to be faithful to uh, honoring them and their family, but not in the animistic way of venerating the dead. Um, so we have to be careful to know cultural principles and things. And that's where cross-culturally, um, over time, you still learn. Well, in studying Scripture, same thing. What you know? What are some of the cultural principles and things that were going on? The customs, you know. In the Old Testament, we find these feasts that are implemented. What's behind that? Uh, how how does how does uh, how does uh, how does the Passover, when it's instituted, impact what we read about? In the life of the ministry of Jesus. In the last days of Jesus. How does the Passover. How is that significant. Culturally to the Jews. And how would that have become significant. To what Jesus says and what he does. So these are some of the tensions. Or some of the challenges to interpretation. There's geographical distance. Our western thought. To the middle eastern thought. Of the first century. Uh. A lot of what we do, as far as that goes, is is our best guess, as far as our best guess, but our best effort to interpret. Because we, I, I've never been to the Middle East. I, I don't, never seen the temple. I don't know the historical places. I, I can read about them, see pictures, but I, in a way, I have to sort of think as best I can through that mind in my study and preparation. It's it's trying to it's trying to get outside of. Uh, my culture, my time, my place, my my understanding, and to think as best I can as what it would have been like to have been a, a Jew in the Middle East in the time of Jesus when all that's going on. See, this is a challenge that exists. But if we're if we're going to be faithful interpreters, that we have we have to that's got to be the work of what we're doing. Okay. Uh, Distance of language between Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic to the English, in English to the various translations. There's issues with that. We already mentioned word meanings. Um, knowing how each of the ancient languages is is being conveyed. Words have meaning. Uh, they change over generations. Man, this is tough work. It's tough work for us in our culture, in our language, and we have a lot of the tools. Now we're trying to communicate that to them. Now, what I don't want us to do, what I don't want hermeneutics to do, is to be a dumbed-down version of, well, you guys can't do this, and we're just going to give you some really, you know, really basic, simple things, and, and, and in essence, not really help them become better interpreters. So it's our work to say, how, okay, how do we take all of this and still teach them to be the best interpreters of God's Word? So in some ways, this kind of module is the most practical in nature, but yet it's maybe some of the most challenging because of what we're having to communicate to them cross-culturally in their setting without the resources that we would have access to. So, um, in some ways it's, it's the most difficult, and in some ways it's yet some of the most rewarding because we get to see all the way through the practical side, as I mentioned, the, the training at the end of each day of taking the passages and working through them. We get to see some of that taking place. Uh, but we want to we want to acknowledge the challenges that exist on the front end, so that way we're prepared.
and prepare them for what the rest of that week will look like. What kind of resources do they have? I mean, as a French background, I mean, Catholicism, we've got... Uh, yeah, Catholicism exists. Um, they don't have they don't have a lot of good evangelical resources. Part of that's because of uh, finances and not having the capacity to have them. Part of that's because some of these guys are out in rural areas where um, books are not accessible. Um, and so that's why we're trying to find ways to, to get some resources into their hands as much as best we can. Um, there there's just not a lot there's not a lot out there that we can get our hands on that we can then get um, taken over. Uh, part of lesson one, a little bit of the idea of the history of interpretation. We just want to briefly tell them um, that this is not a new subject. This is not something that's that's uh, just current. That there's been there's been this idea of the need for interpretation over a period of time, and then the, and then also dealing with the issue of canonization. How how did this even come to be? Why is that significant? Dealing with the ideas of, of the inspiration of the word, um, the authority of God's word, um, and the characteristics of canonization of Old and New Testament, all dealing with uh, with these uh, these focuses on the congruency between Old and New Testament. And then the last part of, of lesson one is, is is what we talk about: the goal of hermeneutics to enable interpreters to arrive at the meaning of the text that the biblical writers or editors intended their readers to understand. Okay, not stopping at the historical meaning, we must take step two to investigate the significance for us today. So, that's what we're saying, we're bridging that gap between the two. If we just simply <coughs> go out and say, okay, here's what it meant, uh, then we just be communicators of truth, or we communicators of fact and ideas. But if we're going to if, into the sort of the pastoral ministry side, or into the, the the practical biblical communication side, is now drawing that bridge from there to here. Gerd Hermeneutics takes us from this to this, and um, you know otherwise it just becomes a lecture of, of information, and we don't want we don't want to develop lecturers of information. We want to develop. They'll develop good, faithful communicators of God's word. Um, when you're doing the intellectual side, are you doing? Are, are you really focused? I mean, you're trying to do a holistic approach. I understand, but when we get down to the intellectual side, at some point it has to become just yeah. fact, the, yeah. the truth. This is what it means to do hermeneutics right. and the implications and the bridge building, the applications and things that are going to come later. They're going to be handled sort of a devotion and practical, right? Yes. And obviously, and for this, into Module 6. Because Module 6 is biblical communication. So, we're laying the groundwork and leading into the intellectual part of Module 6 being heavy on, uh, if you will, semantic preparation. And sort of finishing the bridge from what it meant to what it means. So this is heavy on the front end and then biblical communication or, or homiletics. Module 6 is, is heavier on, on the back end. Now that I have all this factual, contextual information, how do I now then faithfully communicate that in a way that is that impacts the heart of the listener into a desire for obedience, a greater love for Christ, um, and application and meaning. All right. Lesson one would be very introductory, very basic. Um, the challenges, um, the focus, um, the ideas of Scripture as authority, um, the, 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 the connection to the development of the authority of God's words or the canonization. The best book I ever read on canonization is by F.F. F. Bruce. Um, I think it's called The Canon of Scripture. Uh, fantastic book. Um, yeah, but in the module uh, lesson, we give some ideas about the, uh, 
some of the early canon ideas. The three major areas in the New Testament are consensus, apostolic origin, and response to heresy. Again, this is sort of the framework, the outline. You can go in and sort of build on this as you, um, if you're teaching lesson one. Lesson two is understanding literature. All right, so we're getting more into some of the, the tools. General rules of interpretation. General rules of interpretation. Uh, grammatical structure. Um, it's going to be a challenge thinking about grammar. Um, not given having original languages. Um, but I think it's necessary to communicate. I think we need to communicate that um, in a way that they are at least are understanding that there's something deeper, more you know, beyond just even uh, the French translation that they have. Um, if we can put, if we can give them even some of these ideas, then what we can do is 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 either help to find resources as we can over the years or to at least put into their mind um, the need for that if something sounds wrong, if it sounds off, if something doesn't make sense or a thought they begin to have about a passage that maybe is a little less clear, and they say, okay, well, I, but I know this passage over here that we've studied is clear, and this is what it's teaching, and, and so this sounds different, sounds like there might be a, a contradiction, so I need, to, I, need to, I need to think through this, I need to be be careful how I communicate this passage. Um, you know, I need to maybe study it a little more and, and find a little more um, about it before I just go out and communicate something that would be uh, contradictory to what was clear in this other passage. And if we can put that into their mind and into their practice, then we can, um, I think, begin to build uh, a better um, understanding of even some of the, the grammatical structural ideas. Uh, historical cultural background uh, as, is another uh, another general rule of interpretation. The situation that the author wrote. So asking, um, I think it's uh, necessarily gives seven questions for analyzing the historical cultural context. Number one, what's the genre? And these are going to be some of the things that we'll unpack. What's the genre or the style of literature? Who wrote it? Who's the author? What's the date? When did he write it? Who did he write it to? Or the audience? Why did he write it? The purpose? And in the background, what historical cultural details does he assume? So just seven basic questions that we would give them to say, okay, ask these questions as you're beginning to enter into a text for the purpose of interpretation and study. Third general rule of interpretation is the literary context. Discover the meaning of certain words or phrases or clauses. We want them to know words have meaning. They know they that it's the same in their culture, in their setting, but they may not have thought through some of the implications of the fact that their that words have meaning and that studying certain words um, can have great influence over how and what the original author meant to his audience. We want to think about how the Bible communicates its message. The, the genre in establishing the text. Genre refers to a style of literature, right? It's the natural beginning point. If I if I if I go into uh, if I go into uh, into uh, into the book of Ephesians I need to know that that's an epistle. An epistle is a letter. It's a letter from somebody to a group of people or to a specific person. If I read 1 Timothy, that's a letter from Paul to Timothy. Right? So I need to know the genre. If, I, if I'm reading uh, the book of Proverbs, that's wisdom literature. That's biblical poetry. If I read the book of Song of Solomon, that's, that's, that's biblical poetry. That's a beginning point for me as I then approach that book in preparation for study because that's going to give me some specific criteria by which to read it, 
to know what would be potentially communicated through it. Um, and that, that's the natural beginning point to any hermeneutical practice. It's knowing the genre, knowing what that genre, how certain interpretational, uh, interpretive issues need to be dealt with within that. Prophetical books. If I'm dealing with prophecy, there are specific hermeneutical ideas that I need to know when I encounter prophecy. When I'm reading through Isaiah, or I'm reading through Jeremiah, or I'm reading through Ezekiel, and I'm reading these, these about these visions and about these 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 stories and these ideas, that there's a way I engage with those that I wouldn't if I'm reading out of uh, the book of Leviticus. Um, there are certain principles that apply. Um, it's different than how I would approach uh, the book of 1 John, right? Uh, it's different than how I would approach the book of Matthew. Um, and so, this is the beginning point. John right established the text. Before I get into the meat of the text, I need to know what type of literature the text is. Uh, how, to, how the Bible communicates its message through genre. We need to talk about the idea of textual criticism. The idea of arranging the words in an original meaning. And then Nacelli gives general principles for the interpretation of Scripture. He calls it general hermeneutics and specific hermeneutics. Specific or special hermeneutics apply to specific genres only. General apply to all genres. And so he says, through Rob a plumber, as he quotes him, he gives ten general principles that need to be communicated in all across all genres when you're coming to the text, to any given text when it comes to hermeneutics. He says, number one, approach the Bible with prayer. Number two, read the Bible as a book that points to Jesus. Number three, let Scripture interpret Scripture. Four, meditate on what you're reading. Five, approach the Bible in faith and obedience. Six, Take note of the biblical genre you are reading. Seven, uh, be aware of historical and cultural background issues. Uh, eight, pay attention to context. Nine, read the Bible in community. So we're talking about having a community of guys that are reading together. And then ten, begin the journey of being more faithful interpreter. He says, hey, no matter what you do, no matter what genre you interpret, you begin with these ten ideas, these ten general principles are sort of the, 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 the general rules or helps in good interpretation. And so we, 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 want to, you know, we want these guys to be guys of prayer. They're studying scripture. They're not just studying something and then... And